Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. Multituberculates were an order of mammals best known during the Mesozoic. Throughout the age of dinosaurs and well into the Cenozoic, these mammals thrived and often were the dominant mammals of their habitat. As they are extinct, they are easy to assume modern clades like rodents proved superior, but the reality is of course much more nuanced, and in Chimere, they not only persist, they thrive in a wide range of modern clades. Multituberculates got their name from the many tubercles in their molars. Like the rodents upon which they are so often compared, multis have pronounced incisors, and in some species, these grow in continuous rates, which is especially common in chimeran multituberculates. However, the most compelling tooth most multis possess is a blade-like premolar which, in conjunction with the chewing restricted to a stiff yet strong front and back motion, makes for formidable dentition that allows them to process the toughest plant matter. During the Oligocene, a number of large placental mammals were harvested from North America and Europe. Most of these failed to establish themselves, but a few clades, such as entelodonts and nimrovids, became competitive mesopredators, while small herbivores and camel and horse lineages proved quite successful, and hyenodonts went on to become the dominant forces in wetlands where few large theropods had residential presence. When these placental mammals were but a footnote in the Tyrant Dynasty, they were still large and derived enough that the indigenous multituberculates were kept quite small. When the dynastic extinction brought an end to hundreds of lineages, the playing field was suddenly made level. Not only small dinosaurs, placental mammals, and multituberculates were in a position for adaptive radiation. While the known world swiftly became dominated by Miocene placentals, small dinosaurs became large and dominated Chirule. However, their dominion was not as absolute as it had been during the Tyrant Dynasty. Entelodons proved a contender for top predator in the formidable form of the Bokodu. Many mesopredator niches were taken by mammals. Borophagian dogs enjoyed brief dominance, but in Chirule, a multituberculate clade produced a contender from a surprising origin. Thylacolepiformes, burrowing herbivores similar to rabbits, produced the family Carnolepidae, cursorial predators which were social, intelligent, and highly efficient predators. The same shearing premolars that made multituberculates so good at processing tough vegetation helped them quickly process a kill. Like hyenas in the known world, living in complex burrows allowed them to cache away from cockatrices that bullied other mammals away from their kills. It didn't take long for carno leopards to become large, and they very quickly became the dominant presence in the open territories of Cairo. Although they often dominate hyenas and borophagines in this habitat, their caloric needs are much higher which is believed to be the only reason they haven't reached the known world, as doing so requires passage over a vast desert of northern Nikar. Despite the success of this family, and accounts from many Chimeran scholars who studied overseas, the assembly only recently came upon them. The first of these, and indeed largest thus far encountered, is the namesake of the clade itself, Carnolepis fauci apertor, the meat-eating rabbit who opens throats. The local peoples that the assembly spoke with call them the Komatu, with his smile he opens your throat, which was incorporated into their species name. The Komatu is a swift social predator. While they aren't as coordinated in their pack hunting as the common hyena, instead with the most experienced members leading the charge and the rest following suit, the end result is still numerous large predators holding down prey while the Alpha dispatches with a shearing bite which gives the Komatu its name. They retain the inflexible yet strong bite of other multituberculates, incapable of chewing side to side, but formidable in a front and back slicing motion. 
While they are predatory, these incisors grow continuously, though not at the rate of herbivorous relatives in other families. Iron-rich enamel in their incisors and tip of their shear and premolar gives these teeth a reddish hue which aids in their piercing and slicing capacity. This bite is notoriously powerful, with anecdotal accounts of them being able to bite through bronze armor and even steel mail. Although compared to the bite of Thalaka Leo, a marsupial found in the known world, the Komatu's attack is an order of magnitude more powerful, and every aspect is increased to its potential for devastation. This bite allows the Komatu a swift dispatch to not only cursorial camels and rhinos in their habitat, but also dinosaurs up to half a ton in size, such as the sapphire wedgehead. Despite this formidable weaponry, during the wet season, it is not uncommon for as much as 50% of Komatu diets to consist of high-nutrient vegetation such as nuts and berries. In the dry season, if game is scarce, they are able to slice into bone and subsist on marrow, though they aren't as capable of this feat as the common hyena that often shares their northern range. Their sense of vision and hearing are extremely potent and make up a majority of their sensory experience. While they have an enlarged nasal cavity, this is primarily to facilitate efficient breathing during a chase, and they aren't gifted with a particularly potent sense of smell. Like most multituberculates, Komatu possess a venomous spur on their hind foot. While many Maltese have these enlarged in males and even absent in females, they are of equal size in Komatu, a clear sign that they aren't used in duels between males like most Maltese. In fact, males and females are of comparable size and coloration. The bite of Komatu is clearly their primary weapon. The venom of Komatu is not lethal to people, however, it causes lasting fatigue, swelling, nausea, and difficulty breathing shortly after injection. If a Komatu is struggling with prey, they will often kick it a few times to make the kill easier. When Komatu work together, often the subordinate individuals will primarily pin and puncture with their spurs while the leader bites for the kill. Although multituberculates were long assumed to be unintelligent and primitive, recent studies have shown their brains to be quite complex, outpacing many modern mammal groups, and the Komatu is among the forerunners in the arms race of multituberculate intelligence. Their social groups usually comprise of related females and their mates, which are occasionally themselves brothers and their offspring. Some packs are a single pair or bachelor group, while others have as many as 30 adult members, though these larger groups rarely hunt together and usually only live together in loose proximity. It was once assumed that Komatu were egg-laying mammals like many other Nomtherian groups, but like other multituberculates and placentals, they bear live young with a long gestation. While some Chimeran multituberculates have pouches to carry their young, it appears this trait is convergent with Namar supials, not the basal condition. Kumatu and their clades have only vestigial pouches, and keep their young in the warren until they mature enough to travel with their parents. The social instinct, dietary flexibility, and intelligence of Kumatu might make them seem appealing domesticates, but they are so dangerous that widespread domestication has not occurred. They are, however, many beast tamers who have trained individuals for a range of tasks, including hunting, guarding, and tracking, although their sense of smell isn't particularly strong, so other beasts are preferred for the latter. They are, however, a very common and popular form to be taken by skin changers of the Maku and other peoples of Kai Rule. Being around the same size as people, but much better armed, the lineages of Komatu shifters are feared and revered for their prowess in battle. In Grandmother's Roots, third story in Songs of the Inland Sea, a shapeshifter leads the Nuboku, chasing down our heroes. Along with skin changers, Komatu have been recognized as a key component of many homunculi. The iron in their enamel and tooth configuration in general is a trait the first children seemed quite fond of applying to their creations. Although it made their teeth stronger, they may also have simply been a visual appeal of the fangs seeming to be stained with blood. While most diverse in southwestern Kyrule, Carnolepus has since been found in numerous species throughout the vast continent. 
The species with the widest range is the panther hare, Carnolepis pardus. They are taller than Komatu, though a leaner build makes them of comparable mass. There are rumors of a giant species in eastern Kyrule, though this has not been confirmed. Many smaller genera in this clade are known to occupy similar niches to small cats, foxes, and jackals of the known world. The Komatu is a formidable predator. They are yet another successful reminder that clades on Earth dominate by chance, not inevitability or superiority, and that we could have easily lived very different world under slightly different contextual pressures. Cheers to Greg for sponsoring this episode. His art can be found on Instagram at strugglingartist21. The Komatu has long been a part of Chimer, but it has undergone several recent changes. Multituberculates have enjoyed the spotlight and a lot of exciting research in the past few years, and I like to keep things up to date. Just last year, a study conducted at the University of Washington, where I studied scientific illustration, concluded that it is likely that they had live birth with long gestations, much more similar to the placental mammals than marsupials or the egg-laying monotremes to which they used to be compared. This could either mean multituberculates developed analogous birth to placental mammals independently, or perhaps it is marsupials, not placentals, which are the more derived and therefore evolved clade. A few years earlier, another study challenged the notion of their simple intelligence. While dinosaurs enjoy front page news, and indeed many of these studies are quite thrilling, I am glad to see so much research surrounding multituberculates and other early mammals. Evolution is so often portrayed as a chain of increasingly superior and derived animals outcompeting their simpler basal ancestors. However, the truth is much more nuanced, and the multituberculates really throw a wrench in this dated notion. They were extremely successful for over 100 million years, dominating even after the extinction of dinosaurs, but as so often happens, specialization leads to dominance in a given context, but when that context changes, dominance can swiftly turn to extinction. Thanks again to Greg, to my Patreon patrons and YouTube members for your continued support, and to my subscribers, and thank you so much for watching. As I'm sure many of you are excited to hear, next week we will be finally meeting the dreaded Silent Ones of Kaishel, an episode I'm very excited to share. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks!